Well, first of all, uh, Lanfranco, the conductor, and I have worked together many times, both in the States and in Mexico, in Jalapa. So I know, when you know the conductor well, it makes a much easier job because it's like chamber music. We, we are good friends, we actually went to school together and have done a lot of pieces, but this is the first time we're, do, we're doing the Herbert. And I'm quite amazed how the orchestra and the public has received the piece because it's not a known piece. Uh, I love it, Lanfranco loves it because I convinced him to play it. And um, actually Dvořák, the great Dvořák concerto, was influenced by this piece. So Dvořák himself was a buddy of Herbert and he loved that piece. So I feel sort of responsibility to to share it with the public and I, I was quite shocked and, and overwhelmed by the reaction um, of the public and the orchestra uh, right away. So I hope some of the young cellists who are here in the public will take the music and will try to get through it. It's a very difficult piece, but he was a cellist himself, and since he was a cellist, he wanted to show off what he can do, but also he knew what the cello is able to do, so it's, it's very, very difficult, but at the same time, it's written well for the cello. So, I think he was really brave, and then the combination there between uh, lyricism, because his wife was a singer and he wrote a lot of operettas, and the virtuosity of a cellist wanting to show off what he can do. So we are very lucky and, and I think the slow movement of this piece is for me probably the most beautiful slow movement in the cello repertoire. It's just so glorious that whenever I play it I just feel, wow, this is, there's nothing like it. but for some reason history you know, put it to sleep for a while and maybe, maybe my job is to bring it back, I don't know. You know, I like to call him the John Williams of the 19th century in a way because he was uh, in fact very, very successful and very famous as a conductor as well as a cellist and a composer. And last year I played in Lake Placid, upstate New York where he had his summer house. And this summer house is a huge mansion he was really wealthy, uh, writing operettas, and everybody knew him. And then a few months ago I played in Pittsburgh and found out that he was the first director of the Pittsburgh Symphony. So he was really um, a great, great uh, musician in America and very, very successful. And this cello concerto, was he wrote for himself. Um, so you hear all these uh, sort of, I like to call it Hollywood moments in it, and you could easily stage them on stage with actors and you can have singers or let's say Broadway. It's really like a Broadway show in many, many ways, but it's beautiful and the harmonies are great and the rhythm is very trippy. Thank you. 
played uh, the John Williams uh, Schindler Lift theme. I didn't plan it, but those are the two, you know, from 19th century and 20th century, 21st century. And to put them both together, you know, the movie star of the early 19th, uh, 20th century and the movie star of, <laughs> of the 20th, 21st century. You know, some orchestras, I, I travel around the world and sometimes they, it, it's a job. You, you go in Monday morning and you have a new program and you play it and if it's a new piece, especially, you don't really want to do it. I mean, to learn new notes, you've been there 20 years, why, why would you want to move the fingers again? You know the usual. But I find that if the soloist, if the artist that is a guest and the conductor show the orchestra respect and show the orchestra that it's not a concerto, it's chamber music, I need them to take the dynamics that I use. I need them to listen to the colors that I create. And by looking at them and communicating with them, the result is amazing because human beings, the way we talk to each other, I don't need to be from this country. But if I talk to somebody and I look them in the eyes and I tell them something meaningful, they will reply to it. So if I say it through Herbert or through Dvořák or through Elgar, they will usually respond. And I find that it's sort of um, my mission, you know, to communicate first with the orchestra and then, if it's successful, with the public and not the opposite. And I learned it the hard way because when I started my career, of course, when you're a young artist being invited, nobody really wants to hear you, especially as a musician in the orchestra. And I learned it by respecting them right away and sort of thanking them um, emotionally and visually for doing it, even though they get paid and they'll do it anyway will change the reaction towards the piece and towards me and will give me a chance to make music in a better way. So I always think about it and there's a lot of psychology in it and I was very happy here not to do it artificially of course but to do it in a way that they feel that they want to learn the piece and they want to play it with me. And at some point I'm in the rehearsal in the second moment I remember playing um, an end of a phrase that ends in pianississimo and telling them before I ended it take my dynamic. And all the strings, about 50 of them, took it because they're great musicians. So why not? And they didn't have to, they would get paid anyway, but they did it. And uh, not to mention that in the concert, they did it too. So it was a great experience of getting to know each other through music. Well, I wish I could stay a few more days because the Israeli soccer team, the national team, is coming here to play your national team as a warm-up for your team. So I wish I could be here, but you know, our team is not used to 110,000 people in the stadium. And this is going to happen, so I think they're going to be shaking our players <laughs> while they're playing. But I love sport and I wish I could be here, but I'll watch it on TV.